This lecture is on the morphology of necrosis. Um, there are my websites for questions and Dr. Hughes's website and uh, my Twitter handles for where I post unknowns. So for the lecture, these are my two disclaimers. Please read them and make sure that they apply to you before you continue. And one third disclaimer, once again, read it, make sure it applies to you and then continue. The last part is in case you wanna know my teaching methods and what I do, um, please view my introductory presentation. Thank you. So look at the question, pause, look at the question, read it, and try and come up with the answer. And then we'll go through this question at the end of the exam. Okay, so what nuclear changes occur during necrosis? Pause, think about it, and then when you go on to the next uh, image, we will discuss them. So the nuclear changes that you see with necrosis are illustrated here. First of all, in the top left corner, you can see normal myocardium. So you see the normal nuclei. To the right of that, you can see karyolysis, which is where you basically, the nuclei become pale, fade out, and you don't see them. Um, and that's from loss of the basophilic DNA due to DNases. Bottom left is pycnosis. Basically, you have condensation of the nucleus. So what we're looking at there in the far left corner is the cerebellum. That's a Purkinje cell. You can see the cytoplasm is eosinophilic and the nucleus is rounded up and more condensed. To the right of it is myocardium. The arrow is showing a pycnotic nucleus and you can see the increased eosinophilia of the cell around it. And then to the right of it is karyorexis or fragmentation of the nucleus. So karyolysis, pycnosis, and karyorexis are nuclear features that occur with necrosis. So as far as necrosis, the two main types are coagulative and liquefactive. So pause the slide and think about it. What are the architectural differences for each of those? And what organs are classically involved with each of those? And then when you continue on, we'll fill in the table. So filling in the table, in coagulative necrosis, Basically, both the enzymatic and structural proteins are affected, so the tissue doesn't break down. The architecture is preserved, meaning you can look at the tissue. It's very eosinophilic. There's loss of basophilia, but you can actually see what the organ is. Whereas in liquefactor necrosis, the architecture is lost. So coagulative necrosis classically involves, basically the books will say, not the brain. So below the neck and below. So heart, kidney, liver, and spleen but coagulative necrosis does occur in the brain. The one I just showed you before that showed the cerebellum, the Purkinje cells, that's coagulative necrosis. You can still see the architecture, but the cells are dead. Liquefactive necrosis classically is the brain. However, liquefactive necrosis is, uh, one type of it is abscesses, and abscesses can occur uh, basically in any organ. Um, and so what happens in liquefactive necrosis is there is enzymatic, um, denaturation oftentimes from inflammatory cells and the architecture is lost. Um, so you can't tell what organ it is. Robin says it, it's not understood why the brain has liquefactive necrosis very early on. My personal thought is the brain has cells, very few inner space with a lot of neuropil in between the axons and dendrites. And when the cell dies, all that tissue is lost in between and there's nothing holding the cells together and it falls apart. That's my thought. Okay. So with coagulative necrosis, here's one example in the myocardium. To the top left, you can see an acute myocardial infarct. In the septum and inferior wall of the left ventricle, you see that yellow discoloration. That would correspond to what we see to the right, which is um, in this section, you can see both viable, histologically viable, viable myocardium at the bottom and coagulative necrosis at the top. At the bottom, you can see mostly to the right side of that, you can see nuclei are preserved Whereas at the top, you see the cardiac myocyte structure, but you don't see the cellular or um, the cellular or uh, nuclear ES or, uh, basophilia. Another example of renal infarct. Um, so in the bottom, in the middle, you can see normal kidney. You can see normal glomeruli, normal tubules. Compare this to the right. The glomeruli are very congested, but there's no basophilia. The tubules, 
at the bottom portion of the image to the right, you can see the tubular structure, but you see no basic nuclei or anything like that. You don't see the base of filia. Um, so you can see preserved architecture, but the cells are eosinophilic and dead. This is coagulative necrosis. Centrilobular necrosis in the liver is another one. To the left, at the bottom, you can see normal liver. You can see the portal tract in the centrilobular region, and the hepatocytes around each area are relatively the same. Whereas to the right of it, at the top is a low power, at the bottom is a higher power. The portal tract region and centrilobular regions are outlined, and you can see that the hepatocytes around the central lobule um, uh, have uh, basically a loss of uh, cytoplasmic and nuclear basophilia. Uh, you see some degree of the loss of the um, uh, cell outline that there. Um, so that'd be an example of central lobular necrosis. This would be a, a type of coagulative necrosis. Okay, with liquefactive necrosis, so when you think about liquefactive necrosis, um, like I said, abscesses are a form of liquefactive necrosis, but without um, the neutrophilic infiltrate, um, commonly liquefactive necrosis is most commonly associated with the brain. At the top, we see a low power image. To the left of it is the relatively preserved parenchyma, and to the right is the liquefactive necrosis. And so what you can see is basically the tissue is just breaking down. Um, so when the neurons die, the axons and dendrites die, Foamy macrophages come in and engulf them, and that's what you see at the bottom. Those cells there filled with debris, those are foamy macrophages engulfing the myelin and other uh, uh, cellular debris. So one other form of liquefactive necrosis, as I've been saying, is an abscess. So with an abscess, there's a, uh, infiltrated neutrophils. They release enzymes. That's going to break down the tissue so you can't identify where it's from. An abscess could be basically in any organ. So here we see in the top left, splenic abscesses which are commonly associated with um, endocarditis, a pericolonic abscess, which could be associated with diverticulitis, CNS abscess in the bottom, those could be also be associated with endocarditis, and that the right is a renal abscess. So basically an abscess is a collection of neutrophils, it's a collection of pus. So to the right at the top for comparison is coagulative necrosis, the one I just showed you before, so you can see the architecture but the cells are dead. Whereas at the bottom, in the bottom right, it's just a sheet of neutrophils. That's a close-up of an abscess. You cannot tell that came from the kidney. That close-up came from the image to the left that shows liquefactive necrosis or the abscess of the kidney, and you can see the glomerulus. Under low power, you can see what the basic architecture is. But at high power, in the area of the abscess, all you see is the neutrophilic infiltrate. There's no cellular architecture left, so you can't identify where it's from. And the top left is another example of a close-up of an abscess. Uh, you can just see the inflammatory cells. Um, those are just neutrophils in that. Even though they don't quite look like neutrophils, um, it, it seems like with uh, abscess formation and stuff like that, post-mortem change and stuff, oftentimes you'll see um, kind of one nucleus or the not the typical bilobe sometimes and that, but those are neutrophils. So main two types are coagulative and liquefactive. What are other types of necrosis? So pause the slide and then think about what other types of necrosis are. And then go on to the next one, which has the types. Okay, so some of the other types of necrosis are uh, fibrinoid necrosis, fat necrosis, caseous necrosis, and gangrene, which can be wet or dry. So fill out the table. What uh, each of these is commonly associated with and then um, what are the histologic features of that type of necrosis? Pause, complete the table, and then when you're done, go on to the next slide and we'll look at the table answers. So fibrinoid necrosis is commonly associated with vasculitis. It can be seen in other conditions, but that's probably one of the more common associations, kind of immune-mediated disease processes. Fat necrosis is commonly associated with acute pancreatitis and also trauma to the breast. Caseous necrosis associated with tuberculosis. And gangrene is commonly on the extremities. Dry gangrene is just essentially coagulative necrosis, and wet gangrene is coagulative necrosis with overlying uh, bacterial infection leading to liquefactive necrosis. Um, so kind of with just a name for the specific location. Histologically, fibrinoid necrosis, you kind of get this smudgy eosinophilic degeneration of the vascular wall and some inflammatory cells. Fat necrosis, you see foamy macrophages, and you can see calcification, and you can see kind of the remains of the outline of the adipose cells. Uh, 
caseous necrosis are typically caseating granulomas, so central necrosis, like liquefactive type necrosis, no, uh, complete loss of architecture, rimmed by the giant cells. And then gangrene, dry, dry gangrene would be coagulant necrosis, and wet gangrene would be a superimposed bacterial infection, so you see liquefactive necrosis. So this is an example of fibrinoid necrosis. Um, to the left is a vessel, to the right is another vessel, and you can just see this kind of smudgy uh, eosinophilic um, breakdown of the wall, um, and then a couple, some scattered inflammatory cells. With um, fat necrosis, like I said, commonly associated with trauma of the breast or acute pancreatitis. At the top left, we see pancreas with the little uh, white, uh, which would be like chalky deposits from acute pancreatitis. To the right is a really striking example of it. Um, that's um, greater omentum, and you see all the little uh, yellow areas. That's the um, produced by the release of the pancreatic enzymes. Um, so that uh, release fatty acids combined with calcium produces these chalky deposits or fat saponification. Bottom, you see what we see uh, to the right of that image are residual adipose cells, and then to the left are foamy macrophages, which will be from the destruction of adipose cells and engulfing the lipid, giving them that foamy appearance. And here's another uh, microscopic of fat necrosis. This is from acute pancreatitis. To the left is low power, to the right is higher power. You can see the calcification that is commonly associated with this. And then you can see close up the foamy macrophages. And then the spaces would be the residual kind of um, remnants of the adipose cells. Caseous necrosis. So on the top right, this was peripancreatic caseous necrosis. To the top right, right under where it says caseous necrosis, that's the pancreas. And then over there to the left, that kind of cheesy material is the caseous necrosis. And then the two micros, top left is low power, bottom right is high power. So the central uh, area is necrotic. It's breaking down. It's like liquefactive type necrosis and then rimmed by the giant cells. So when you have granulomas with central necrosis, that would be caseous necrosis, which is most commonly associated with TB. And then this is an example on the extremity, wet gangrene. Uh, see this commonly in patients with diabetes because um, of the um, nerve damage, don't feel injury, vascular damage, don't repair that injury, and then can develop uh, non-healing ulcers. If those ulcers get secondarily infected, as this one did, you can kind of see the pus-type material, then that would be wet gangrene. Okay, so back to the question. So look at the question, pause, go through, answer it, and I'll give you the answer. So basically, we have a 53-year-old male with history of hypertension, 30-pack year smoking history. So he's got risk factors for coronary artery disease, uh, the crushing chest pain, the EKG eleva ST elevation, LVH prone I would be consistent with an acute myocardial infarct. Found two days later, so there's time for the change to develop. Um, and that point, we would see uh, coagulative necrosis. Um, you could argue that the thing about with uh, an infarct is that you get inflammatory infiltrated neutrophils, eventually the tissue starts breaking down. So ultimately, most everything goes toward liquefactive necrosis. But um, the coagulative necrosis, I think, would be the best answer. Okay, so this is just outside of Billings, Montana. It was just an interesting cloud uh, structure I saw one day, took a picture of it, and that is the end. Thank you.